ultimately it's results, of course, is what shows you whether or not an investor is good, but that's just the output. What determines whether or not somebody would be successful? I think it feels like there's two schools of thought and I'll let you know which side I land on. It's so disappointing, but if it's somebody who's truly outside of the areas we believe we can be helpful, we wish them well. And we will sometimes introduce them to friends who we think know those areas or could be helpful in those areas. But ultimately, I think for us, like time is the scarcest resource. Hello, everyone, and welcome to FinTech Leaders, coming to you from New York City. I'm your host, Miguel Armasa. I'm a co-founder of Gilgamesh Ventures, a venture capital fund that backs early stage fintech entrepreneurs in the U.S., Canada, and Latin America. If you enjoyed this conversation, I invite you to leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your show so more people can learn about fintech leaders. In this episode, I sit down with Dan Rosen, founder of Commerce Ventures, a fintech and retail focused fund that's been building an impressive portfolio since 2013. Some of their investments include Bill.com, Marketa, SoCure, Move, MX, and many more. Dan is a veteran investor and has been in venture capital for over two decades. In this episode, we discuss building a venture fund and how their thematic strategy has evolved in the last decade, qualities of great tech and fintech investors, the real advantage of second-time founders, why we are starting to see signs of a moderate comeback in the growth market, and a lot more. Dan, welcome to FinTech Leaders. How's everything in SF these days? Uh, it's a beautiful sunny day here. Thanks for having me. Glad to be on. It's great to be doing a second episode. The first one was back when I was still at Wharton FinTech. It's been, I think, almost three years, so it's going to be a good refresh. <laughs> Agreed. Yes. A lot has changed. <laughs> That's true. And speaking of change, Dan, you've been in venture for close to two decades You've been leading commerce, I think, for half of that. What's been the biggest change in the industry, specifically in venture, since you got started and then also since you launched commerce? Yeah, so the industry has changed pretty substantially since I got started in venture. So when I started in venture, it was a much smaller industry. The number of firms, it might have been a tenth of the number of firms as we have today. The definition of what constitutes a firm has evolved. So there's a lot more solo GPs today than there ever have been in the past, and and certainly small partnerships like CVs. But there's been a proliferation of practitioners in venture. And obviously, just the industry as a whole has expanded quite a bit. And those things go hand in hand, not necessarily directly correlated, but like closely. And so the dollars that have flown into venture as an asset class have expanded quite substantially. And then I think on the other side of that, that, that's sort of the supply of capital and practitioners investing. On the other side of that is the supply of founders and would-be early employees and, and startup participants, like that's exploded as well. So just like the whole ecosystem has grown explosively in the last, again, called 23 years since I got started. And then a lot of that changed kind of in the first wave leading up to me starting Commerce Ventures which was in kind of, we, we did our first closing in early 2013. But if you think about the advent of cloud computing, that led to a, a, a pretty meaningful unlock in the cost of starting a business or starting a startup. And so the sort of wave of founders and entrepreneurs getting started in like the late 2000s and early like 2010s, like that was, I think a lot about very scrappy, I can build a product using cloud architected cloud hosted software in a way that's kind of much less expensive than it used to be to develop software and deliver that software via the internet and kind of people can consume it that way and and so the, the amount of money i need to raise in order to get started and to actually get customers and product market fit and generate 
meaningful revenues even is substantially less. And that, and I think that unlocked that wave of innovation in that call it eight to 10 year period. So when we started Commerce Ventures, I think what we saw was sort of the cost model had changed dramatically, which created an opportunity to modernize a bunch of technology systems and infrastructure, but it hadn't been applied in a vertical way. And when we sort of look at not just cloud computing, but then mobility and the proliferation of mobility and mobile connectivity, we recognized that kind of commerce broadly, but you think about retail and financial services, we're undergoing, and we're in the early phases of undergoing a, a pretty fundamental transformation around the way in which the kind of the a consumer or small business or any anybody who's interacting with those industries would experience kind of retail and financial services, whether that be kind of researching, sort of purchasing, interacting with the types of products and services that they may want, but also in the way that the institutions, the brands, the retailers, the banks, like the way in which they they run their businesses, the core systems and in processing capabilities that support kind of the delivery of products and services. So when I got started, if you want to oversimplify it, it was really just about, can we invest in the infrastructure that's more verticalized that will unlock this next generation of products and experiences that people want that are inherently digital, like mobile first. And I think since we've gotten started, I think that has become the dominant expectation of consumers and customers in these industries. I wish I could say that the opportunity has been fully exhausted. I think we we're still very early in the adoption of these modernized systems and infrastructure. But the other thing that's changed is, is just when I got started, there weren't that many new emerging manager firms. I think today that really kicked off in the early 2010s, if you will, and proliferated substantially in the last five to seven years. So now there is a large number of, of new firms. And I think it's both awesome and a little challenging because I think the awesome side is kind of, we get to work with people who didn't have to go through a lengthy path at some traditional venture firm they could they could be coming from many different backgrounds and that diversity of backgrounds and experiences brings a lot of different ways they can add value and different ideas which is great the challenging part of it is like there's it's the paradox of choice for founders for lps and they have to figure out like how do i know which investors i should partner with how do i know kind of where to make my lp commitments how do i sort of look at all of these different choices and compare them against each other. So those are the, just a few of the things have changed. Yeah, just a few. <laughs> and then how are you internally at commerce figuring out what's next or where do you want to focus on? If I remember correctly from our conversations over the last few years, internally, you're always working on a few ideas, right? On a few theses. Maybe take us through how that works. When I started the firm, my belief was that you couldn't be a sector-focused investor. And there really weren't many, if any, sector-focused firms back then. But my belief was that you couldn't be a sector-focused firm without being thematic. And so what does being thematic mean? Well, when it was just me, being thematic meant I'm going to look at a category or an area of innovation, and I'm going to try to look at every company at the same time, and I'm going to look at it on, on the, the backdrop of how I think that part of the value chain will contribute to the mo like important like modernization or step function change in kind of experience or cost reduction or whatever for the ecosystem. And so like the idea, so to bring those two things together, one is like having an idea about kind of what trends are happening and how those will sort of be captured in a value chain or the opportunity could be captured in a value chain and then thinking very specifically about the providers who could enable that to happen, like all together, like, like which one of these players is most likely to be successful. That to me is when you combine those things, that's being thematic in the way that you invest. The way that we come up with theme ideas 
is, you know, it's probably not a mystery, but we're constantly reading. We're talking to, I mean, in our model, another staple is we're talking to large enterprises all the time. We're also talking to startups all the time, of course, but like these enterprise relationships are really important to us because these are the folks who by and large are delivering the products and experiences and services that kind of define the industry. And when we're speaking with them, we're constantly probing for kind of what pain points exist in their business, how they're reacting to new opportunities, challenges, regulation, you know, kind of new technologies like generative AI. So we're constantly probing for that. And then based on their both firm specific priorities, but also kind of their reactions to broader trends and opportunities, we're determining a short list of themes we should be pursuing that we think are time relevant to the market and the industry as it stands today, but with a view towards adoption and dramatic growth in the foreseeable future, maybe three to five years. So that drives a lot of, of how we compare and contrast which theme to focus on and candidly identify a lot of like collaborators who will help us figure out which companies feel like they're better matched for the opportunity and maybe even early customers for the startups that we might invest in. And internally, how do you divide responsibilities? And, and you don't need to get super specific, but now it's not just you, right? You, you have a team. I have the pleasure to meet many of them. I, I met maybe half of the Commerce Ventures team. But how does it work? I know you're also training people to raise the ranks. How have you manufactured this process? Yeah. So just to give a little bit of the context so you can contrast it. When I was at Highland, my former firm, all of this work, this theme work would be done by the same professional who was also out hunting for investment opportunities, sitting on boards. Like each venture capitalist was sort of his own franchise and you were doing a bit of everything. So I was doing a bit of everything when I got started. But what, what became clear to me in the early days of Commerce Ventures was that we could get a substantial amount of like strengthening of the like the thematic muscle and that the theme could be at the core of how we differentiate if we had dedicated experts who could focus on the relationships with the large enterprises, right? Like which fundamentally there's only so many hours in the day. So if you can, if you're deciding whether or not you're spending them with startups, with executives at large enterprises, like there's a, there's a tension there. And so having folks who live and have lived in that world and understand how to work very carefully and collaboratively with folks in that ecosystem, I thought could be a, a really important way of, of bringing the enterprise participants into our ecosystem. And the other side of it was creation and adherence and implementation of this like thematic process. So there's like this strategic analytical approach to asking questions and how do we come to informed answers and opinions about what we think is going to happen and then develop work product based on that. So like the, the actual theme document, if you will. And so back in 2017, when I, it was still most like early 2017, it was really just me and one other investment professional, actually a Wharton alum, Dan Rave, if you ever heard that name before. And it, we expanded the team, brought in a gentleman named Ice Brandt Marsalis or Ice for short. And Ice came from that background of like, had been in and like corporate strategy and like enterprise BD at some large enterprises in financial services and payments. And I'd also been, I'd known him a while and, and had been an early supporter and investor in our, our first fund. So anyway, so he's come in and brought a lot of that discipline, both in terms of like the relationship management, but also the process uh, for the theme development. And that frees myself and Matt and Vivek and others to be able to focus more on bringing the startups to the table, the founders to the table, being able to like focus on the pattern recognition on that side of the equation, but like partnering very closely so that we're sitting in many of the meetings with our large enterprise collaborators and we're bringing in our corporate development folks into many of the pitches, the advanced ones or the very highly relevant ones with the startups where we think there's high thematic relevance. 
Now switching, I guess, to the other side, the, on the investing side, in your experience, what makes a good investor, a good VC? Because now you have worked with many people, both at Commerce and even more outside. You've crossed paths, I would guess, with probably thousands of investors or at least hundreds. You know, where, where have you landed on, on what makes a, a good investor? I hate to say something as simple as the math of delivering a lot more proceeds back to your <laughs> investors than, <laughs> than they give you in terms of paid in capital. But I mean, ultimately it's results, of course, is what shows you whether or not an investor is good, but that's just the output. What determines whether or not somebody will be successful? I think it feels like there's two schools of thought and I'll let you know which side I land on, but just, just to frame it up, one school of thought is like, I'm just a big brain kind of computer equivalent, like looking for pat, like ingesting data and looking for patterns and trying to kind of identify money-making opportunities based on that, upon those patterns. Like that's, I think one school of thought, and I should say that underpins both, but like one is very much about like a theme and a thesis and like an investment strategy. And I think the other one is about just people. It's just like, I have insights towards people or I have a great network and I'm leveraging that network and harness like extracting value out of it. And ultimately like anything, it's like the truth is probably a blend of the two of those. I think from our perspective, we view the people side of this as like a table stakes thing of like, you can't be successful investing in startups, especially the types that we invest in, which are relatively early stage without there be a, being a heavy reliance on high quality talent and a commitment to continue to invest in talent along the way for your best startups. That's just part of the job. But I think for us, we don't see it like the ability to uniquely differentiate ourselves based upon just a view on talent or talent network. There might be people in, in, in our sector who, who would feel like they can, and they have very unique strategies towards that. But I think for us, we view that is really, really important to be thematic if you're going to be sector focused. And so having a thesis investing in a company that like fits with the way you see that thesis unfolding and having a source of capital and a capital deployment approach that matches kind of that theme development and your ability to invest in companies. We view those things as like lining all of that up in a way that is cohesive and well aligned and makes you a friend, not a competitor to other great investors who are also kind of in, in our space, that ends up being, I think, what I suspect will make somebody believe that I'm a good investor. And as I look at people that I work most closely with, and we've talked about Vivek, as I think about Vivek, like I see him doing those things. That's why I think Vivek is a great investor is because I see him bringing in a network of great people, but then kind of leveraging the thematic approach to be able to identify opportunities that fit well with the unique perspectives that we and our ecosystem can evaluate and develop and then invest into. But then what happens when you run into an amazing company or amazing group of founders that are outside of those themes, of the themes that you've been looking at? It's so disappointing, but if it's somebody who's truly outside of the areas we believe we can be helpful, we wish them well. And we will sometimes introduce them to friends who we think know those areas or could be helpful in those areas. But ultimately, I think for us, like time is the scarcest resource. I mean, certainly dollars are scarce always, but like time is the scarcest resource. And so our view is that we should be investing in companies where we believe we are relevant enough to be a difference maker if required, if there's an opportunity. And so if we're investing outside of areas we know well, or in a different industry, then I think we're just purchasing a lottery ticket. Now it might be a winning lottery ticket. And it, like, I think there's a decent argument that like we can identify talented people after having been investing in founders for a couple decades. But when I go to pitch my next fund, how do I explain that lucky success or that sort of non kind of aligned success? nobody's going to give me credit for it because it doesn't fit with this very tightly defined strategy that I've articulated. 
So somebody else should probably focus on investing in those. You've kind of covered this already, but maybe share a little bit more of your portfolio construction process because at commerce, it's a, it's a little bit different than I would say the bulk of early stage investors that I talk to. Let's hear a little bit about the process that you have. Yeah. Being different, I think is great. At least for us, I like that we operate a little bit differently. Makes it easy for people to understand what we do and how we could work with them and how we are different with other folks when they're making decisions. So going back, rewinding to this idea of, of being thematic. And by the way, like a theme idea could start with a founder, like a new area that like a founder is poking at. We're like, oh, that's interesting. We never thought about that before. So we can identify new themes that way too. But if you go back to the theme, if we're going to do this work, if we're going to spend dozens and dozens of hours on theme work and pull in a lot of different people, we want to make sure we have the best shot possible of investing in a company that that theme work identifies as being a potential category winner. So if you imagine for a second that a company can go on to be worth a billion dollars, $5 billion, $10 billion, then having conviction around that, or even a, like a strong hypothesis around that coming out of the theme work, you want to do whatever you can to invest in that business. And so what I, I realized early on in fund one for us was a $16 million fund. So we couldn't really lead any rounds back then. We were just too small of a, of a fund. I, so we were a non-lead investor. What I realized in the process of being a non-lead investor is almost nobody had a problem with us investing alongside them as a lead because they felt like we weren't competitive because we weren't. And so if I combine those two insights, which is that like, we're going to do all this work on the theme. And then we want to make an investment in the company that is the answer or one of the answers from the, the theme hypothesis and the highest probability of being able to invest into any particular round is if you're asking for a small allocation as a non-lead, it quickly became clear to us that like, why wouldn't we maximize the chance to be able to invest in the companies we think are positioned to be category leaders? And then let's get started working with them. And if they think we can add value and the relationship is good on both sides, then we should ask to be able to invest more money. Now this sort of, I just kind of did this almost intuitively with some of our fund one portfolio companies. So it wasn't like I thought about that in advance, but as I saw myself executing on that strategy and us executing on that strategy, I realized that it was just different than the way other firms at, like operated. We didn't ask for the rights upfront to be able to invest more money in those companies. We just said, Hey, if we earned it, then, and like, we'll tell you that we'd love to invest more and you'll either say yes or no. And it turned out that a lot of people said yes. And they said yes, because we were interacting with them regularly. We we're helping, we had good rapport. And so our strategy really is that. So we start with these initial investments that are tend to be relatively small and non-lead. And then where we see that we can make it, we can be helpful. We have a strong relationship. We will try to invest more capital into those companies. So I, I want to talk a little bit about what you're seeing today, but I think it's a good segue to talk about founders, right? What, in your experience, what is the hardest part of working with founders as a VC? I think founders are humans, VCs are humans. The hardest part about working with other humans is that you're different people, right? I mean, and by definition, we use equity to align our incentives. That's the beauty of the venture capital model is that we buy equity. So in theory, we are very aligned with founders. But there are all these like points in time or corner cases where you become a little bit less aligned. It's tempting often to believe that you have some insight about what's going on in the business that might be a different point of view than the person who's operating the business. And that's dangerous because like one, you're not in the business. And two, like ultimately we don't run businesses. We can't run businesses. That doesn't work in our strategy. So like at points of misalignment, right? When things aren't quite clicking for the business and you're trying to figure out what, like you can become misaligned. And like, I think the most challenging part about working with, with founders is really creating the ability to work through those moments of tension and misalignment in a way that is constructive, that's rooted in first principles approaches, like rooted in data, 
is as like non emotional as is possible on all sides. And so like, I imagine this is, this is the, this is the hardest part about working with founders and probably what founders would say would be the hardest part about working with VCs. Yeah. And you've worked with a lot of founders. Something you were telling me before we started recording is that now you're seeing a good number of repeat founders come back to the market. I take that as a great sign today of, of where we are as a point in time. Maybe tell us a bit more about that. Yeah. So I think for a variety of reasons, we are seeing a surge of repeat serial kind of founders who've had successes before, and in some cases, very meaningful success coming back to start their next business or raising around for their next business. And just because somebody has been successful before, doesn't mean that they'll be successful in their next venture, but it's so difficult to create something from nothing. And there are a lot of different challenges that a founder goes through in order to build that somebody who's been on that journey before, and especially somebody who's been on that journey before and had some success, it's easy to imagine that they have been through a lot of those difficult challenges and understand how to map a course when they're faced with adversity. And so like, I don't know that it's the challenges themselves that always end up being the sort of the issue for a founder. It's actually the way that we respond or that a founder responds to those challenges that ends up being probably defining of whether or not you're going to be successful. I mean, the odds are against success from the beginning. So failure is the most likely outcome from the beginning. And even with these repeat founders, we assume that the chances of success are smaller than the chances of failure. The reasons for failing should be different. Like the reasons that like you wouldn't be commercially successful might be because the commercial opportunity isn't what we thought it was or developing a product that would solve it is not feasible. Those would be very reasonable outcomes. Even if the investment's not successful, you're like, that was a good hypothesis. And we tested it and the answer is that no, there isn't a, a good business to build here. But hopefully repeat founders have the advantage of not tripping over failure risks that would be bigger traps for first time founders. I distributed my equity the wrong way. I made some bad hires and I didn't correct like quickly enough. I brought on the wrong investors, just even the way I'm building product or how I'm selling it, or like who should be my first customers? What, what defines that? How do I go find them? Do I know them already even? So like you, there's just all these advantages that somebody who's been through that journey before, especially in a relevant area like they have. And does that mean that you've also had success backing repeat founders in the last couple of decades? So I think the conventional wisdom of venture capital was to try to only invest in repeat founders when I first got started. What occurred because of what we discussed earlier is this proliferation of venture firms, proliferation of capital and proliferation of founders. We exhausted the supply of serial founders to invest in. And by the way, like if you have a lot of success at a certain point, there's only so many startup journeys you want to be on. Maybe you transition to retirement or investing yourself or whatever. So there is definitely a finite supply of, of these serial founders. So there was a long window in this middle phase that I was describing of like, there just weren't that many serial founders to invest in. But what's occurred in the last three to five years is that many of the companies that were started back when CV was just getting started have had exits and the founders of those businesses have rested, invested, or taken some time off or started building something new. But in any case, many of them are now at a point where their second startup is the thing they're working on. In some cases, it's a third, but in many cases, it's somebody who had that first success and now is doing the next startup. And so we're just now in a place where there's a, like a meaningful supply of those people, I think. And then switching gears a little bit, we are at least a year and a half in <laughs> since the market turned, right? It, it, it just became different in many ways. The early stage never really went away. Founders are always starting companies, but the growth stage was frozen for a long time. Where is it now? We are seeing the first signs of the growth stage thawing 
So I'm not sure if it's fully playing out in the numbers that we would see from NVCA, but, and, and certainly valuations have come back to a much more traditional sort of norm around valuation multiples. But even in our own portfolio, we've seen three of our semi-mature portfolio companies. So companies that, you know, kind of have eight figures ish of revenue run rates and varying getting their next term sheets at meaningful markups in a couple of cases, kind of north of a billion dollar valuations in rounds that feel like what you would hope would happen in a pre 2020 era. So like relatively normalized. So it feels like those are signals to me that the growth stage is ready to invest in good businesses at sort of reasonable multiples, which is super encouraging. It's still early in that process, but I, I think that will eventually ripple backwards so that if we can plan for those types of growth rounds, then we understand maybe how the middle stage of venture works and can map a course from early stage. Yeah. And by the way, we have a smaller portfolio than yours, but we are seeing the same thing, right? Very, very similar. So it, it's definitely possible to raise a growth round. You just did the numbers and what you need as a company is different. Then before I let you go, I see a couple of books behind you. Any book recommendations, any favorite books? The last book I read, which I highly recommend, was Hail Mary. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. No, I haven't read It's a dystopian future-based novel by Andy Weir, who is the author of The Martian, if you ever read or saw the movie with Matt Damon. So awesome book. Highly recommend it. This is great. I'll add a link to the Amazon site for that book. Awesome. Well, then, thanks again for joining. I know there's going to be both VCs and founders interested in, in this conversation. So a lot of people are going to find it very, very helpful. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's always fun chatting with you. And let's just try to do some more deals together. Absolutely. Let's do it. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this great episode with Dan, partner at Commerce Ventures. If you want more interviews, make sure to subscribe, follow, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever gets your shows. It helps and truly means a lot. And if you have any suggestions or thoughts about the show, just drop me a line on Twitter or LinkedIn. Signing off till next week, I'm your host, Miguel Armasa.